Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Wilson and I'm the Communication Coordinator for PrivateWellClass.org. This is a joint national program of the Illinois State Water Survey and the Illinois Water Resources Center at the University of Illinois. Funding for our program comes from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in collaboration with the Rural Community Assistance Partnership. PrivateWellClass.org offers free education for private well owners. Our signature program is a 10-week email course designed to help you learn the basics of caring for your well just 15 minutes at a time. It's completely free and you can start anytime you like. We also offer a series of topical webinars as a supplement to the core materials found in the class and that's where you are today. This is an opportunity for you to ask questions of our experts. Today's webinar focuses on septic systems. There will be a brief presentation followed by an extended period for questions. This is an opportunity to get answers about caring for your septic system and best practices to protect your water supply from associated contamination. Your instructor today is Steve Wilson. Steve is a groundwater hydrologist with the Illinois State Water Survey and the lead author of the Private Well Class Curriculum. During the Q&A portion of today's webinar, Steve will be joined by Ron Helton, a licensed septic system contractor and owner of D&D Sewer in Lincoln, Illinois. To ask a question, please use the question box located in the GoToWebinar control panel on your screen. Those questions will go to me during the, during the event and I'll add them to the queue for our Q&A period. In some cases, I'll even answer you directly. The webinar will last about an hour, but we'll go over if needed to make sure that all questions are answered. Today's webinar will be recorded and posted to our website at a later date. Before I turn it over to Steve, we'd like to gauge how many of you are attending live with us. So if you could complete the poll on your screen, we'd love to know how many people are in viewing in your location. Is it one, just you, two, three, four, or five or more? We definitely want to welcome those of you who are having quite a webinar viewing party today. All right, we'll just do a couple more seconds here. Let's see, okay. Are we ready to close the poll? Great, now can you display the results? Look, most of you are just watching in your own location by yourselves. We wanna thank you again for joining us today. All right, we'll stop showing those results. Great. All right, Steve, you have the floor to get started. I'm going to unmute you here. Unmuted. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so, yeah, today we're talking about septic systems, and uh, Jennifer's already explained it, most of the details, so we'll just get started here. Um, I'm Steve Wilson with the State Water Survey. I'm a grammar hydrologist, as she mentioned. And so, um, the point of these Q&A webinars is really, it's a short lesson, if you will, and a lot of the time will be spent on the Q&A. So um, hopefully it gives you a good overview of what you need to know and what things are important to uh, consider regarding your septic system, especially related to your public health and your drinking water and your private well. Okay, so septic systems are a wastewater treatment system. Just like if you were in a community water supply like I am now, um, you know, the community may have service water intakes or private or, or community wells uh, for the water that runs through their treatment plant, then it goes to the consumer, and when it leaves there, it goes to a wastewater treatment plant. Well, that's what your septic system is. It's a, a personal uh, wastewater treatment system, basically. And um, so it relies on a natural degradation by bacteria, the bacteria that get in your septic tanker from our waste. And so uh, it creates a system in there that reduces material and then it, it can harmlessly infiltrate into the natural groundwater system. And so you'll hear us today talk about uh, there's a tank, um, there's also a drain field, and, and those things allow, the tank allows you to separate the solids from the other material, and it also gives the bacteria a chance to do their job and break things down. And so in the end, things are, uh, it's a natural system, and so um, the liquids leave, Eventually, you'll have to have the solids pumped, 
um, and we'll get into to all those issues. But the idea really is it degrades everything uh, from your house waste, and um, it's a really simple system. They work really well. They have for many, many years, and as long as they're maintained, um, they do a really good job. So here's um, this is from the National Environmental Services Center, uh, this diagram, and this is an example septic system and drain field. Um, in this case, it's a two-tank uh, tank or two-compartment tank, and that allows more settling of solids, and it also um, helps protect solids from getting into uh, the drain field, which is a perforated pipe on the right side. And so the idea behind this is uh, the effluent or the material from your home, your shower, your toilet, uh, your sink come into this uh, tank. Um, some things float on the top. That's called the scum. Some things sink to the bottom. That's the uh, solids. And in the middle is the water layer that is more moves through your um, system drains than into your septic drain field. Um, another example of that here is a single tank, um, again with the scum on the top, that's the things that are, that are uh, lighter than water and then the clear water in the middle and that's where um, water is taken from uh, through the outlet pipe and goes out through your system. It should have an inspection port and it should also have uh, this 21 inch opening um, in order to be able to get into your system and, uh, and, and pull out the solids. Many systems, folks have no idea where their system's at. A lot of times that gets buried, and so um, that's one of the problems. Eventually, your tank will fill up with sludge. And so um, over time, if you don't maintain it, um, your system can't function properly, and eventually solids will get into your drain field and plug those perforated pipe uh, openings. And once that happens, uh, your system won't work properly, and we'll show you what can happen there. Um, so there are estimated 25 million homes in the United States um, that have septic systems or on-site wastewater system. That's about one in four homes, uh, the EPA estimates. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of folks, even uh, small communities where they may have a, a community drinking water system, a lot of times uh, if they're small enough, they still have septic. And so in some of the worst case scenarios are where you have a small town of say less than 100 homes or so where everybody's on a private well and everybody's also on septic and their wells are all shallow, uh, that's a recipe for um, your septic um, causing contamination of your wells. And so those are the things, one of the things you need to be aware of. So when they fail, um, usually you'll find out one of several ways. Um, if the, the drain field can't um, get rid of the effluent, eventually it'll seep up out of the ground, maybe up out of one of the openings in your tank. Um, one of the first indicators may be uh, around your tank and your drain field. There's thick green grass or material. The ground can get spongy or even a pool of water will form. Um, you know, we've had folks contact us and say, you know, I'm not sure where my septic tank is, but we're having problems. There's a smell and we've got this small pool of water that even when it doesn't rain, we have, you know, water in our backyard. Uh, that's your septic because uh, you're continually adding material to it and there's nowhere for it to go. And uh, those things, um, you should notice the smell by then. And worst case, um, you know, it can back up in your house. And it's estimated that about 10% of homes with septic systems have experienced their septic backing up in their house. In many cases, that's uh, folks who never realized they had to maintain their system. They didn't realize that it should be inspected and all those sorts of things. Um, but knowing what you need to do and what problems you can have with your septic system um, will prevent all this from happening. So it's really a matter of, of knowing what you need to do. So as far as septic system issues, one of the first is proper sizing and design. Um, your septic system is designed usually based on the number of bedrooms in your house. But in a lot of cases, you might add on or you buy a home and, and it's had an ex uh, an expansion added to it. Uh, maybe originally the house was designed for two people and now there are five. That all affects the load on your septic system and on your tank and have the amount of solids that go into your system. And so knowing those things and knowing the size of your tank are critical to understanding how often you might need to have it inspected um, or pumped out so that the solids don't uh, build up too high. Your system works properly because of the level of water that's between the scum floating on top and the solids at the bottom. If your solids are allowed to build up, eventually they'll build up a 
all the way to the um, outflow uh, pipe, and that leaves no room for water uh, to actually, in the bacteria to work, um, to degrade all that material, and so it starts getting into your drain field and those sorts of things. Um, many, many septic systems are um, old, over 30 years old, or even much older, um, a lot of rural areas in the country, and so they aren't designed uh, or weren't designed according to the code and uh, the research that we know now uh, for sizing those things or the way they're designed or having screens over the um, outflow pipes so that solids can't get into the drain field. And so knowing all those uh, issues and talking to someone locally about um, where your system is, what the regulations are, and what other wells might be in the area um, are all important. Um, especially knowing if there's wells nearby. I know um, sometimes there's a setback for a private well based on where your septic system is, um, but that may not have accounted for your neighbor's well, or maybe someone bought a property next to you and they've added a well since, and it turns out it's close to your septic system or, or your septic system is close to their well. Um, those things all can cause public health problems, obviously. So knowing what you need to do and um, where your well or where your septic system is are all um, important things. Um, if you do manage your system properly and have it pumped and follow all uh, the best practices, your system can last a long time. And that's the same way with your well. If you maintain your well and you follow best practices, you um, make sure that you know, you're know you not overstressing things or you're uh, doing the maintenance you need to do, it'll last a lot longer than if you just let it go until it, until it stops working. So. Um, for sizing and design, um, so as I mentioned, as your tank fills up with solids, there's less uh, volume there for the system to work and the bacteria to do their job. And so understanding how much volume is actually there um, and di dictates how often you need to pump the solids out. Um, it also depends on the size of your drain field as far as how much water is being used in the home so that it can sufficiently infiltrate into the ground. Soil characteristics, excuse me, soil characteristics come into play in that um, situation as well. If it's a really tight clay soil, you probably need a larger drain field or more of um, more gravel placed around the outlets so that it can uh, have a volume to drain. Um, all those things uh, your contractor can help you with, or possibly your county or state uh, health department. Um, I guess the, the one message is every tank fills up eventually. Um, you will have to pump it, and if you don't, eventually it will fail. And so, um, again, maintaining things the right way uh, will allow that to last longer. We find systems where uh, 30 years ago maybe there weren't regulations in a certain area um, where these systems actually ran straight to a field tile. So there is no, um, there might not even be a tank. But if there is, there's no drain field that goes straight to a field tile or even straight to a stream. Um, some rivers you can uh, boat down and you see these pipes sticking out on the side, and a lot of times those are the outflow for a septic. And uh, again, uh, as I said here, that's very bad. And um, there's been changes in the law in some areas, and these days uh, those things may be illegal. Um, you need to talk to your county. Um, or your health uh, department to find out if there's something you need to do there. I know in some counties where they've taken, they've been more aggressive with the new law. Um, they've given uh, homeowners you know, three or four years to uh, to change their system um, before they find them or um, do something about uh, making that legal. From the public health standpoint, um, again, if you have a straight pipe to the surface somewhere, whether that goes to a field tile that eventually runs to a, a ditch or whether it goes straight to some sort of discharge. Um, understanding the regulations um, is important. It, it could save you a lot of headache later. It's also, you know, there's a public health issue there. Um, that material has E. coli or can have, and uh, bacteria that may be harmful. Um, it, it adds nutrients to maybe a very small uh, stream that can cause uh, problems with the ecology of, the, of that as well. Um, Understanding where your drain field is and your groundwater flow direction. As far as your groundwater flow direction, um, that comes into play if you're using water from a shallow well, then 
if your septic tank is upgradient from your well or your septic drain field, then water is going to flow naturally towards your well, which is a bad thing. So typically you try to install your private wells so that it's uh, upgradient of the septic system or that your septic system is downgradient from your well. And that's great if you're on a homestead or a farmstead of your own, but in some rural subdivisions, unless you're uh, the farthest house upgradient of the direction of groundwater flow, um, you know, your neighbor may have his system downgradient of as well, but it might be upgrading of yours. And know, knowing those things um, will give you some peace of mind and help you understand uh, those issues, as well as knowing uh, about your well itself. Um, a well that's shallow, maybe if it's a bored well, is a much more susceptible to surface contamination or from a septic field than a well that's deeper and maybe screened at, you know, at a deeper interval. Um, if it's a bedrock well, it may be deep, but that may not mean uh, that it's that protected. Typically, bedrock wells are installed with a, with a casing just seated into bedrock. So if bedrock is at 50 feet, you may have 60 feet of casing and the rest is all open hole. Um, because the rock, uh, the hole you've drilled in the bedrock itself serves as the well, as the, the well casing. Um, but if it's a sand and gravel well, it's also 200 feet deep. The screen may be at 190 feet, which means there's 190 feet of solid casing um, above that screen. And you're much more protected from something at the surface. And so you need to understand the relationship there, um, what kind of well you have, how deep, uh, where your water's coming from. And this is one of the things that is explained in the class uh, that we offer as well. Okay, um, maintenance. They have to be managed just like everything else, even your, your, your well and your water system. As I said before, they will eventually fail, um, but you can certainly prolong that with proper management uh, by inspecting your drain field and um, your tank and knowing how thick your sludge layer is and making sure it's pumped on a regular schedule as well as a lot of things you can do um, in the home to protect your tank. Nothing should go in your system that isn't naturally, uh, isn't natural material. Um, any kind of toxics, uh, you know, even cat litter, grease and coffee grounds as I mentioned here, those add solids to your system. Um, in a minute I'll mention um, a garbage disposal. Anyone with um, a sewer or a, a septic system really should not use a garbage disposal that runs through their septic tank. Um, it creates a lot of uh, natural material that um, adds solids to your tank in a much more, uh, much faster. And so if you have, um, I'm going to show in a minute um, a diagram of tank size versus how often you need to pump based on the number of people. And all of that assumes that um, you're, you don't have um, a garbage disposal because that dramatically reduces the amount of time you have between uh, with solids build up in order to uh, keep your tank working uh, the way it's supposed to. Um, all right. So here's one example of the estimated tank uh, frequency for pumping. And it says right here at the top uh, that this assumes no garbage disposal. And that will dramatically uh, increase the amount, how often you need to uh, have your pump, or your tank pumped. Um, this came from the National Environmental Services Center from Pipeline. They're uh, from 2004. Pipeline is a brochure or a magazine, if you will, that, that, that Nessie puts out quarterly um, that provides useful information. Um, you can find it on their website. And um, they gather information from a bunch of different sources. And so, um, you know, this is strictly based on estimates of household size, number of people, determines the number of flushes, number of showers, you know, how much you have in meals for uh, water use. And so, as you can see, as the tank size goes up and uh, the number of people goes down, um, it might be many years between needing to have your, uh, your tank pumped out. But, um, you know, if you have a small tank, like a 750-gallon tank, and you have six people, then it probably needs to be done at least every year. And with the garbage disposal, that would be even more frequently. So uh, tank size matters. Um, if you don't know, you need to figure out um, what the tank size you have is. 
um, there may be records with your county um, offices. Um, if not, uh, you can have a contractor uh, try to help you find that information or determine that for you. So um, a septic to-do list. Uh, maintain the area around your tank and drain field so that you can access the tank when you need to, whether that's to measure uh, the thickness of the sludge in your tank or if it's to um, actually pump your tank. Um, try to only have grass around your system. If you have trees, um, roots can get in your system and, and either clog it up or um, reduce the amount of flow um, that can leave. Uh, just cause, you know, tree roots cause a lot of problems. And as far as concrete or asphalt, the idea there is, um, you know, it's a natural system that's based on infiltration into the ground. If you put a concrete pad over your drain field, now there's no infiltration from the surface, and it's really rainfall at the surface that starts infiltrating above your drain field that helps drive that system down uh, through um, the soil. And so you don't want to circumvent that as well as um, having that weight compacts the soil and it can cause uh, less flow and reduce the amount of water that can infiltrate. So um, the other thing you need to do is try to reduce the amount of flow into your system. Again, uh, the bugs basically need time to work and break things down. If you're putting a lot of things uh, with high volume water through your system, that doesn't have time to do that. It also causes more mixing in the tank. And so you may be seeing more solids get out through uh, into your drain field and when that happens those can get plugged and so um, you know no sump pumps whirlpools and as far as softener backwash I'm going to put timed here newer uh, softeners don't use a timed uh, a time clock basically to decide when to back flush and when to regenerate they use um, they know based on um, the quality of the water so they may not backwash but, but once every week or two um, depending on your water use, but older softeners um, use a timer and sometimes those may be set to every two or three days um, or they may be set to run longer than they need to and so you may be putting hundreds of gallons of water through that you know, two or three times a week and not only, uh, you know, there, we'll get to at the end, and one of the questions is about water quality related to that, but um, it just creates a lot of volume of water can uh, that gets in your system. Downspouts, just the downspout from your roof. Sometimes those go into um, a system, um, just not a good practice. So uh, the other thing is only put wastewater into your septic system. Again, a garbage disposal really increases the amount of solids. A lot of those can't get broken down if they get down in the sludge layer. And so um, that will increase uh, how frequently you need to uh, pump your system. Um, the question about additives, uh, that are supposed to help your system work better. Um, I mentioned this um, when we did the last webinar and I had a number of emails from folks saying, I use this additive and my system's been great for 30 years or um, a lot of other uh, issues. We've researched this. We've actually done more research since the last webinar a month ago and there is no evidence that they, they help. Your system's working properly um, and it does what it's supposed to do. Um, Actually, the truth there is that um, they're not needed if it's ran, if it's working properly. Your system has enough bacteria. It's doing what it's supposed to do. If you're not adding toxics, you're not adding too much bleach or any of those other things, your system works. It's uh, in equilibrium, if you will, and it does the job it needs to do. And so you don't need any kind of additive. It's usually, it, it, worst case, it's a waste of money, um, or best case, it's a waste of, of money. Worst case, other things might happen, like it could increase your solids formation or it could cause some kind of die-off of the bacteria uh, that are naturally in your system. And so it's just not a good idea. And, you know, common sense says no man-made stuff, no paint, uh, anything toxic, um, no kinds of chemicals, no pharmaceuticals, anything that might disrupt uh, the biological working of your septic system. Um, and one of the most important things is the last one here, inspect your tank regularly. Um, you should have someone check it, make sure that your solids, so you understand how frequently they build up. If, you know, you've been living there a long time and you know that every three years you need to pump your system, that's something you can count on. If something changes, like, um, you know, 
you more people start living there or fewer people start living there, your kids grow up and move out, then that may prolong things or change things. But you need to um, have some idea of how your particular system is working. And the best way to do that is to measure your solids and then pump your system and, and to figure out how often you actually need to pump it. So that's really the basics of running your septic system. And so what I wanted to provide for folks um, is more information that's available on the web uh, initially. And there's several new resources out there that are worth noting. One is um, EPA has developed this uh, septic smart program and it walks through the basics and why you need to maintain it. It's got resources available. There's a nine page flyer, um, if you will, or brochure that walks you through all the common issues that folks have. Um, it tells you a lot of the same things I'm telling you today. And um, it's uh, a place you can even ask questions. And so it's a really good website. If you just Google septic smart, one word, um, you can see our US EPA septic smart. You can find this page and uh, it's worth just going through once to have uh, to become more comfortable with um, what's going on with your septic system. Um, additionally, I mentioned the National Environmental Services Center. Um, NESI is a training and technical service provider that's been around for a long time. Um, they are also serve as a clearinghouse for information and they have a very extensive um, septic and wastewater section, if you will. They have a lot of information and in products. They also have staff um, there that um, get questions through their hotline. And from that, you know, they've developed a lot of resources on um, do's and don'ts for septic systems and what things you need to be worried about. And it's really, it's worthwhile uh, to go to. And if you just Google National Environmental Services Center or look them up, the URLs here at the bottom. And I think we mentioned this at the beginning, but just to be clear, this webinar will be on our web page eventually as a recording. And so you can uh, look for it there too and find this information. Um, one of the more recent resources that's been developed is uh, this mobile resource called Septic Insight. NRWA has developed this and it's really kind of a tool to use for um, a homeowner um, to look at um, different basics of your system. So you know, how to locate your septic tank and how to measure the dimensions if you don't know, um, how to set up a pumping schedule. Many of these things that are on here, I really use it once and now I know this so you wouldn't use it again. And so some of these um, maybe would have been better as a web page instead of a mobile app. Um, but there's also, um, there's also this inspection tool where you can, it asks you a bunch of questions, many of them are very common sense, but in, uh, on some of these topics, surface water and vegetation and uh, those issues, there's things that at least you should be aware of. And by answering the questions, at least you're refreshing those things in your mind. And uh, they also provide these additional resources at the bottom. And again, um, EPA Septic Smart and also the Small Flow Clearinghouse, which is NESI. Um, so you can get to those things. And so it's um, pretty useful and it's something if you ha have a mobile app and you're interested or mobile phone and you're interested that, in that, um, I took these screenshots from my, uh, I use a, a Google and Android phone um, and so I included these on here. Uh, again, it's a useful tool. That's really what I have for, uh, oh, I guess I went to I'm ahead of myself here, excuse me. Um, last slide. So even with all the information available on the internet today, and there's a lot of good resources, you should always talk to uh, folks in your area, especially your health department, you know, co-op extension, your state wastewater agency, and um, your septic installer or inspector that's in the area. They have the most uh, up-to-date and as far as local information, if you will. So if there's an issue in your area, I know especially with private wells, this happens. Um, you may have a specific geology or specific water chemistry. Um, I'm not going to know that necessarily. And when you call us, I end up calling back to your location and talk to someone at a county or state level who may have that information. But the same way here, every state's different. Um, for instance, I mentioned the softener backwash. There are a few states that don't allow you to have softener backwash go into your septic system. Um, I don't know that entire list. I only know a few states, but um, your local folks will. And if there's any specific issues, um, there are things like experimental uh, on-site treatment systems that 
some states may allow you to use. Others won't because they don't meet their code and they haven't been tested enough or they have some kind of specific soil condition um, that they're concerned about. All of those issues, um, you need to talk to somebody locally. Uh, they're here to help you. A lot of times I know folks, um, I grew up in the country on a farm, and um, sometimes it's like, well, I don't want to call the county. Or, you know, people don't realize, like uh, for private wells, um, how many people have not called the county health department because they're afraid if they have the county health department test their well, they're going to make them not use their well. Well, they don't have the authority to do that. And understanding the rules and knowing uh, what your rights are um, open those doors for you. And your health department is really there to serve you and help you. Um, not to uh, try to, quote, govern you. So you should always uh, try to use those folks when you can. Okay, so we've got a lot of questions, and um, we're going to come back in a few minutes and go through those. Um, if you have any questions, uh, as Jennifer showed earlier, there's a place um, on the GoToWebinar menu bar on the side there to ask your questions, and we'll try to get to those at the end. Um, but Ron Helton of d d Sewer Service in Lincoln um, is on the line and he's uh, been listening in and he'll go through some of the questions that uh, I'm not a uh, septic expert. I'm not an installer or inspector. He is. Uh, he's licensed in Illinois and um, someone who um, can provide, you know, more on the ground and practical advice uh, for some of these issues. So um, we're going to mute the line for a few minutes while we get those questions put together. And then we'll be back to, um, to answer those. And I'll go ahead and show the first three questions. And um, we'll pause right there. Muted.
unmuted. All right, uh, we're back. And um, uh, Ron, are you on? Yeah, I'm here, Steve. All right, well, um, many of these questions are going to be for you. So um, again, Ron Helton from t and Sewer in Lincoln, Illinois. Um, so we'll just start with the first question. How do we get rid of tree roots? Well, there's a there's a few ways to get rid of tree roots, but uh, the the most common way is um, we use and at my work all the time what they call a, a eel machine or a roto rooter. And um, what you have to do in most cases is dig up the pipe and then you put a cutter inside the pipe and cut the tree roots out. Uh, those tree roots can and will return, but you know um, whenever we dig that up. Usually what I do is put in a, a clean out or an access so in the future we can clean the tree roots out again. All right. Yeah, it's best just not to have trees nearby. Um, yeah, the best practice as far, as far as septic systems go is to just keep the trees away from your system. You know, um, they're, they are bad for small pipes for sure. Yeah. So what's the best way to measure the sludge in a tank? Well, there's actually a tool out there called a sludge judge that the, uh, the people in the industry have. And um, basically what it is is a glass tube and you stick it down in there and it pulls out a sample of the layers that are in your system. And then, you know, based on that, what that sludge judge reads, it tells you how much sludge is in there uh, to, you know, give you an accurate measurement. but you know, typically what people do is take a shovel or whatever and just kind of poke it through and see how thick the material is. Um, you know, if it's more than two or three inches thick on top, it's probably time to think about pumping your septic tank. Yeah, and probably the, I mean, the best advice is probably just to have a contractor uh, unless you know what you're doing because you're really going yeah, through exactly. it scum layer and everything else and it's kind of hard to judge which is really the solids at the bottom so right exactly um, they, you know, contract uh, somebody that uh, does a lot of septic tank pumping can and will know you know if the tank needs to be pumped or not yeah okay so um what would you recommend people ask um if you know if they were going to hire you to be a uh, to inspect their system, what kind of questions should they ask you to make sure they're getting someone who's professional? Well, the first place I would go, I'd go to your uh, local health department or governing body, whoever whoever oversees uh, septic contractors in your area, and just talk to the person in charge there. Hey, you know, can you give me a list? And uh, of that list, do you have any recommendations, or do you, you know, who who's the who's kind of been in the business the longest. You know, a lot of times uh, the guy that's been around has seen a lot more than the guy that's just a startup. So, you know, maybe uh, you'd, you'd ask, the first question you'd ask is, you know, how long have you been in business? Uh, and then kind of go from there. You know, you can usually feel a guy out to see if he knows what he's talking about or if he's just trying to, trying to get your money. Sure. <laughs> All right. Um... So we we were asked we'd be offering this class as a web as as a class and as well as a webinar um, probably not right now um, doing the septic part of this is kind of an add on if you will um, really this is a private well program and so um, we will uh, probably well this webinar will be recorded and it's available um, but we probably won't have a class lesson there may be down the road so. Um, the next question is, you know, what's okay to put down my sink? And, you know, Ron, I would assume nothing that's not natural, but, you know, any... Yeah, you, you kind of answered that question earlier in the broadcast. You know, any the only things you want to put down your sink and, and into your septic tank are, you know, water, uh, as little food as possible, garbage disposal, they are bad. Um, uh, I know in the state of Illinois, if you um, have a garbage disposal and you're on a septic system, uh, your tank size increases by at least 50% of the capacity. So if you had a 1,000-gallon tank with no garbage disposal, you would have a 1,500-gallon tank with a garbage disposal. But in my professional opinion, I, I've seen systems with and without, and 
I would recommend never putting a garbage disposal in a septic system. Sure. Okay, uh, next question about additives. You know, we've talked about before, um, and we've had, like I said, when we, we did this webinar a month ago, and a whole bunch of people emailed us back and said, I use these additives, and they're great, and they sent me links to all these uh, different sources. Um, so we investigated this further over the last month, and uh, the bottom line is this page is from um, Nessie's website where they've actually, it's called Septic Tank Additives, and it talks about research that's been done and um, you know, the lack of standard testing, and the bottom line is that it's just not needed. And that's what everybody has found. And usually it's, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier on, on the webinar, um, they can even cause problems. You can have, if you add enzymes, they can do things to break up the scum layer, which um, may cause problems with things getting into your drain field. Um, or they could increase solids formation. And so, I mean, the bottom line is, um, no matter, if you think your system's been working great, it's not because you put in an additive. It's just that uh, your system's working like it's supposed to. And, um, you know, it's up to you if it gives you peace of mind. Matter of fact, um, we emailed EPA and asked them, uh, the folks at Septic Smart, and their response is, it seems uh, from what they found, a lot of folks like to use the additives because it gives them peace of mind and that makes them feel like there's, their systems are, are working like they're supposed to. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what to say to that other than um, science says that it doesn't help. And so um, I'm going to leave it at that and um, everyone's welcome to disagree. Um, and if you, uh, you may be in a unique situation where, you know, it is doing some good, but um, there really is no proof that that's the case. So. Um, if I'm going to move on. Uh, can septic kill trees downstream? Um, I don't know if that's really a question about the amount of water or if it's because of the, all the nutrients and all those other things that might be uh, getting uh, into the tree. I know you can burn grass if you um, put too much fertilizer on. So, Pete or Ron? Yeah, I, um, can they kill a tree? Uh, I'm sure they could if, uh, you know, if you flood the tree out and the tree doesn't like wet feet. Um, I'm sure you could drown a tree out. As far as the fertilizer aspect, what I've found and what I've seen is it actually usually makes the tree thrive and, and grow crazy, but in the, in the same turn, those tree roots are also plugging up your septic system and will eventually cause your septic system to uh, stop working. And then you got to get someone out there to dig it up and, and uh, get the tree roots out. So, you know. Like we talked about before, the best practice sure. is to keep your system away from trees. Okay, so how can I prevent smells from entering my home through the toilet? Uh, well, typically, um, um, on most of, on most home plumbing systems, there's a vent stack that goes up and out the roof, and that should take all the smells up and out. If if you're getting smells, then um, you would probably have a plugged up vent pipe or um, maybe no vent pipe at all. I've seen in a lot of older homes, sometimes there is no vent pipe. Um, if you're getting a smell back through your toilet, um, you've got some other plumbing issue going on because actually the toilet creates what they call a water trap or a water seal and the smell should not make it back through that seal. Great. Okay. Um, what about using copper sulfate to kill tree roots? Uh, copper sulfate does kill tree roots. Um, now, copper, you know, I, I don't know exactly what copper sulfate kills, but I've heard that copper kills everything. So if you put it down there to kill tree roots, you might also kill your bacteria in your system and all the stuff that's supposed to be there. So uh, I would avoid that and, and have the you know, have a professional come out and probably cut the tree roots out versus putting a chemical uh, in my system. Okay. Um, and does it hurt to have livestock in the drain field area, or what about a large truck? I know um, a lot of folks in the country have pastures with livestock, and I'm sure their drain fields are in those areas. Um, well, it could, um, depending upon how shallow your drain field is or uh, how shallow the pipe coming out is. You know, if if the system starts to fail or gets oversaturated, now you got a bunch of cows uh, um, walking over the top of it, of course they're going to sink and then possibly crush the pipe and 
driving trucks and vehicles and tractors over a system is definitely um, a bad practice, you know. They, uh, it, it can smash the pipe or whatever material they're using for your drain field. And once you've smashed it in, in that area, that shortens your drain field by that much. So if you smash it in the middle of the lateral, then you've shortened your lateral capacity by 50%. Oh, sure. Um, okay, so someone with an old concrete septic tank that's now on a city sewer, you know, they know there's a concrete top there. You know, what should they do? Fill it or tear it out or? Um, well, what you what you need to do is um, take the top off and um, you actually need to fracture the sidewalls and the bottom so it can't hold water anymore. And if it's full of water, you know, you'd have a, a um, septic pumping contractor come pump the thing out. And then uh, what I do here is use my backhoe and I break the bottom up and I break the sides up so it can't hold water. And then you can backfill it with sand or, you know, native soils um, from your area. And, and you actually can leave the concrete in the ground, but um, you would fill it up with soil so it wouldn't settle on you. Okay. Um, is it necessary or desirable to insulate the mound or, or tank in the winter? Well, I'm from Illinois, and we, we do not do that here, but I have heard in like Minnesota and northern climates that um, they uh, insulate the the caps that are coming to the top of the ground and the reason they do that is because the cold air can freeze the top of the tank and and maybe cause some issues but um, you know does it help it probably does help in extreme climates and and um, you know bacteria work just like other bacteria do it needs a little bit of warmth and stuff to thrive so um, if the temperature is really cold, of course the bacteria is going to die out. And, you know, the warmer you can keep those, the more they're going to uh, reproduce and keep your system working properly. Okay. Um, so we also received a question about water softener backwash, if it's harmful to the septic system. And the exact question was really long, but it was from a contractor who said that um, they find this black sludge in a septic tank or in the drain field, and it only seems to happen when there's softener backwash. And so um, we've looked into this. Um, I'll answer first if it's okay, Ron, and then you can follow up. So what, the best thing I found was from the state of Rhode Island, and they've got this best management practices for the discharge residential water softener backwash brine. And uh, it's only a couple years old, and uh, the bottom line is it says that um, there are certainly cases where the brine from your backwash can affect um, your system, either the bacteria or um, because brine is salt water, it's heavier than um, regular water. It sinks to the bottom and reduces the amount of uh, fresh water that is available for your bacteria to work. And so in this document, which you can find online or we'll put on our website um, once we get our septic page up, which uh, might be a few weeks, um, it says that basically um, they in Rhode Island they don't disallow it, but they don't recommend it. And so um, they do mention in this in this document that the states of Massachusetts and Connecticut um, have prohibited uh, the backwash brine from being uh, from going into an on-site wastewater treatment system, which is your septic tank. So um, you know what there's science out there that shows that. It may not be as harmful, and there are certainly cases where it probably isn't. But um, like the person who asked this question, um, in some cases you do see it, and under certain soil conditions you see problems with the salt interfering uh, with the soil matrix itself and how it uh, lets water infiltrate in the drainage line. So um, my take from what I've read, and I'm not an expert, um, is that it's probably not a good idea. And if uh, it does happen, and if you have especially one of the older softeners that are on a timer, um, make sure that's set properly to work the most efficient way it can. Because if you've just got it set to, you know, to backwash twice a week on schedule for 20 minutes each, you may be putting several hundred gallons of material through there a week, and uh, you want to limit that as much as possible. So, uh, Ron? Yeah, I, I think, you know, my professional opinion to put the 
salt water, you know, the brine through your septic system is probably a bad idea. Um, what I've noticed, uh, I've noticed the same thing with the uh, black dead tank. And what I think probably happens is, um, you know, somebody does laundry today and they use a little bleach and somebody, you know, we use antibacterial soap to wash our hands every day and now we're regenerating our salt, uh, the salt brine into the septic system and a combination of all those all those things together just kills the bacteria uh, totally out in the tank and then and you see exactly what the guy was talking about, a, a black slimy sludgy material and, and that stuff will make a septic system fail. Well, and, and I think you make a good point. It's, it goes back to that's why the recommendation is to limit what you put in there. And by itself, it may not be a problem. But if you, you know, like you said, if you've done laundry that day or you've done, you know, maybe this is laundry day and you've done seven loads of laundry that day. And so you're really putting a stress on your system. So it's just a, a good practice if you can avoid it. Um, having a separate line uh, for your uh, backwash, um, I'm sure costs more money, but I believe um, if you do that, don't you have to discharge it through a separate, some kind of separate system? Yeah, and uh, what they changed the code in Illinois now. Um, your your um, backwash cannot. It, well, it's not supposed to go through your septic tank, but it can go to your drain field. And then what they recommend here is you increase the size of your drain field based on the number of gallons that the that the um, backwash is going to create, or you can um, just put in its own miniature field just to take care of the of the backwash. So, you know, uh, in my opinion, the, you know, the best practice is to not put it through your septic system because it's just, it's usually a combination of things that causes the tank to die and, and then you get exactly what the guy said, a, a dead tank. And then eventually, um, you know, if you're not paying attention to it, then you would have uh, that stuff making its way out into your distribution box or into your drain field, and then it, what it does is it kind of creates a black, slimy sludge layer on top of the dirt uh, in the septic system, and then instead of the water being able to go through it, the water comes to the surface, and that's when you get the pooling and ponding in your backyard, or possibly even back up into your house. All right. Okay. Um, I'm this. We're not done. We've got some questions. I have to um, get out of this and go into. Um, our, um, we have some questions here on Google Docs. Um, if I can figure out how to enlarge this. Uh, hang on one second. Okay. Um, so first question, and um, and can you mute Pete, uh, Ron for a second? So, uh, okay, so I can answer this first one. Um, can I get CEUs for this webinar? Unfortunately, no. Uh, you know, this whole, the whole premise of this program that we um, uh, are in uh, was to provide resources for private well owners. And we haven't really pursued, um, as of yet, um, a lot of CEUs, either for sanitarians or other groundwater professionals. Um, that is going to change. Um, we are working with the National Environmental Health Association. Um, to develop a version of at least the private well class that would be on uh, NEHA's website um, on their e-learning center that will allow you to get CEUs. It'll probably be at least the end of the year before that's available. And so um, from that standpoint, um, we haven't asked about CEUs for any of these uh, webinars. I mean, my take on that is that um, there usually has to be a quiz or some way to test your knowledge at the end to get credit for it. And, uh, you know, we're not set up for that. So um, that's probably where we're at today. So, uh, okay. You can unmute Ron. There we go. So what's the difference between a septic tank and a mechanical treatment plant? Um, well, a septic tank is is really gravity feed and uses natural bacteria to degrade things and um, you aren't necessarily treating water to a point 
that um, it could be discharged where a mechanical treatment plant um, um, does do those things. It, you know, you have different kinds of treatment processes to remove solids, um, you're using uh, agitation or whatever, and then um, you're also doing chemical treatment and a lot of, well, I guess you said mechanical, you're doing other things to get that water to a certain water quality so it can be discharged. And I hope that answers your question um, because they are developing, because of the new rules for um, on-site treatment or on-site wastewater uh, systems, they're developing um, a lot of new rules that will, um, you'll st I think we're going to start seeing more advanced wastewater treatment at individual homes and buildings. And so, um, again, I am not an expert on that. And um, I can, if you want to email us, you know, our email address is info at privatewellclass.org. Um, I can get you to someone who probably can give you a better answer if that's what you're after. Um, Um, the next question says, I have a question regarding separation distance between septic tank and field. Um, Ron, is there a guideline for that or a certain recommendation for separation distance? Uh, well, in the state of Illinois, um, I know the, that our septic code between your actual septic tank and where the actual drain field starts, is there's a minimum of five feet. And uh, I think that has to do with the system you know, the system leaking the water back around the septic tank and maybe causing some issues there, but, you know, every state's different, so um, you really you have to contact your local health department or um, local governing body that says, hey, what, what is the separation distance between the tank and the field? Okay. Um, next question, um, are there alternatives to standard garbage disposals or a different way to plumb a garbage disposal that doesn't use a septic system? Boy, uh, have you seen that? No, I haven't seen anything. Um, you know, probably the best thing to do would be to start a compost pile. You, you know, you'd still be getting rid of your waste, but um, you know, if, if you didn't want to put it in the trash, then maybe the best practice would be to start a compost pile. Uh, I, I've never seen anything that, you know, where you could plumb your sink up to a, a different type of system, I guess, and and uh, not good as a septic tank. Okay, the next question um, I think I can answer. It says, when is it okay to have a septic system discharge into an open ditch or waterway? I don't believe you can do that anywhere. Um, it's certainly not a best practice. Um, and maybe some states are behind uh, a little bit in passing the right laws for those things. Um, but I don't believe uh, it's considered a discharge. And, it's, and, and nowadays, I believe it's regulated by the US EPA. You know, like a, a wastewater plant or any industrial plant that discharges into an open body of water um, has to have a permit. It's called a National Pollutant Discharge and Elimination System Permit. And um, we may see more and more private or on-site septic systems require those in the future. And I'm not up on exactly what the law says, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that the federal law says that you cannot. So. Yeah, so... so um and within the last year or so, they um, probably what they're talking about here is an aerobic system. It used to be um, you could have an aerobic tank and then go straight from that tank and maybe do some kind of chlorine treatment and then dump it straight into a ditch or a tile or you know discharge it somewhere like that. Well, um, in the past year, um, the EPA has come up with you have to get an NPDES permit, which is is what you were uh, speaking on earlier. So um, before you can uh, discharge to a ditch, you actually have to get a permit, and then um, they come out. I think it's every six months, and uh, someone has to test the water to make sure it's up to the proper wa water quality standards um, to continue discharging. So well, I think okay. that's probably what they were talking about. I imagine so, and I learned something today. So, okay, so what's the difference uh, of using a standard drain field pipe with holes in it versus panels? I'm not sure what they mean by panels. Okay, so what they're probably talking about is a uh, um, um, chamber system is what we call them around here. And basically a chamber system is just a, um, 
um, the bottoms open and then it has slots in the side and they're about two feet wide and anywhere from like eight to maybe 15 inches tall and it just creates a dome and then the water filters out. Um, there really is no difference. It's just a matter of how the water distributed. Uh, you know, in a in one that has holes, the water goes down and then fills that pipe up until it reaches the um, reaches the level of the holes and then spills out. So, you know, really, um, there is no difference. It, it's just a different type of system. Okay. Um. So this next question, I'm going to read this. Um, my tank is probably 40 years old. It does not have an internal piping. Uh, have the internal pipe in your illustration show it's simply an entrance hole and an exit hole is that acceptable um, I've been told that it appears my tank is shifted downward at the end where wastewater enters this causes the entrance to be below the level of the water in the tank should this be or must this be corrected can that be done without replacing the tank hmm well um, can this be corrected no there probably is no way to correct that issue without replacing the tank um, and if there is just an entrance and an exit there should be a wall at least in front of the exit and that's called the baffle so instead of having an internal pipe that goes under the water the wall acts as that pipe so it uh, stops floatable solids from floating out the pipe and then eventually plugging the pipe or your drain field um, so, you know, as long as there's a wall there, I would say you're probably okay. Um, if there's not a wall there, then you should definitely contact a, a local uh, septic tank guy in your area and get them to put it, that's called a baffle, and get them to replace your baffle because eventually what happens is the floatable solids float out into the lateral field and plug it up and then, then the entire system quits working. All right. Um, and, you know, Ron, I don't know if you are deal with any gray water systems, but um, I have not. And so um, this is a, something that we can certainly look into and provide on our website. But um, I really, you know, gray water systems are basically reused water uh, from uh, that's been treated. And, um, you know, you see them more and more uh, community systems using them for irrigation or on golf courses and, and different things. Um, but as far as for a private system, um, maybe using it for a garden or some of those sorts of things in an area where there's not a lot of water, um, you know, I'm not familiar uh, with those practices. And so um, I'd have to look uh, that information up and, and try to provide it. If, uh, if you're interested in having us do a little research for you, um, send us an email and um, we can certainly get at that question. I think that's the last one. Yeah, okay, so um, that's all the questions we have today, and uh, it's five after two, uh, central time anyway. Uh, Ron, thanks for uh, your time and providing um, support to a lot of folks here, and uh, for all of these that are on, thank you for attending. Um, if you have any questions, you can certainly email us or call us. Um, let me put that back up real quick. Uh, uh, there's our information, and um, thanks for attending. Thank you. All right.